Welcome to the FNO InsureTech Podcast, a place where movers and shakers from all points within the insurance ecosystem gather and discuss all things InsureTech. We talk about how technology and innovation are affecting and driving change in the industry. Here are your hosts, Lee Boyd and Rob Beller. Hey, podcast world, you might be thinking, what is that sound? You might be thinking, for whom does the bell toll? Oh, that's nice. Good job. You like that? I do. I like Uh, that. uh, I just, yeah, I found found that. I started that book. I started that book, but it was quite long. Is it good? Yeah, the first 50 pages were great. Uh, But a little intimidating. Yeah, I'll get back to it. Well, the bell tolls for you today. Because we have a podcast that's pretty exciting. In fact, do you know, Lee, the definition of the word supersede? Well, not anymore. I did about 20 minutes ago, but I can't remember it. It means to take the place of a person or thing previously in authority or use to supplant it i.e. the older models have now been superseded. Yeah. And today we have on Ben Rose and Jared Lee, co-founders of Superseed. Just a fascinating company. You know, we've not really as a podcast been able to dive into the world of reinsurance. It just has not come upon us to interview a lot of people with reinsurance. We've dabbled in it and we, we've talked a little about it, but today we have people who know it, they know it in and out, and they are using their company to really take reinsurance where it's never been. They're streamlining processes, they're connecting people, they're doing analytics in this space, and it is a fascinating company who not only do Rob and I agree with that, but startup generators have also agreed. And it's quite amazing. It is a remarkable company proposing and implementing a remarkable idea into a old, established, even antiquated world. Yeah. And I, I think they're making big waves. And like Lee said, the accelerator community that evaluates these new insure tech startups agrees with it too. Yeah. I think you're in for a great podcast here. Uh, we're going to get to talk a little bit about these guys, how they came up with these ideas and just really a good look, not only at Superseed, but a reinsurance. So a lot of this podcast yes, is really right. focused on what, in the words of Rob, what the heck is this reinsurance thing? <laughs> You know, so we ask some dumb questions in our world that they are very nice and polite to to respond to. So I hope that our listeners who, you know, might want to learn a little bit more about reinsurance, you know, I, I think everyone will enjoy this one. But we know that people listen to our podcast from all parts of the insure tech ecosystem. And so maybe reinsurance doesn't come up on your radar because you're a distance away from it in what your particular application is. But trust me, this is not only interesting from learning what reinsurance is, but learning how to deal with a big problem yeah. in a creative way. Yeah, re- reinsurance is at the center of the ecosystem. It's that function that allows the rest of us to live. And so it is. it touches every aspect of the insured tech ecosystem one way or another. So without further ado, let's get to our interview with two of the co-founders of the three co-founders of Superseed, Ben Rose and Jared Lee. Hey, everybody. We have two guests with us on the show today with Lee and I Yeah, from the other side of the pond. That's right. Both coming to us from in and around London, England. We have Jared Lee 
co-founder and CEO of Superseed. Hello, everyone. And Ben Rose, co-founder and president of Superseed. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? There we go. There we go. So happy to have you all on today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Happy to be here. Great to have you on. And we also have listening and muted a veteran of the FNO InsureTech podcast, Eleni Chen, coming to us from Italy. So this is a whole, we have an international flavor today. Is that fair to say, Lee? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, all that being said, all those introductions done, let's jump in. First of all, thanks so much for joining us today, guys. And I'm sure it's much later in the day than it is for us. It's 8.15. Was that eight hours different? Eight hour different? Yeah, it's coming up on 4.15 here p.m. So where are y'all? Jared, where are we talking to you today at? I am just south of the river in an area called Vauxhall, but um, for reference for the for the listeners, I'm about a 10-minute walk to Buckingham Palace. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, As a cool. point of Do you ever get over there? Do, does the queen ever see you? I don't know if she sees me, um, but <laughs> she's. I, I run by it on my sort of daily running route. It's it's less than a, maybe a mile and a bit from my house. So that's how fun. awesome is a that? Frequent spot on my running route. When I run, there's just a lot of houses, and that's quite boring. You run by Buckingham Palace, which is also a house, I guess, in some respects. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Yes, Apples kind of one Apples. extreme of houses. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Ben, where are you? You told us before the podcast that you have recently relocated outside of London. Is that right? That is right. We're, we're embracing the remote work revolution. So I'm, I'm now actually out in the countryside. So when I run, I only see sort of sheep and cows. Uh, but I'm, I'm on the border between England and Wales, which is, is very peaceful, more productive than ever. That's wonderful. Based on the movies, the countryside of England seems just absolutely wonderful and just beautiful and somewhere I would like to visit. It's very idyllic. It's, you have... Um, we don't have many proper mountains, so if you want proper mountains, go somewhere else. Go to Scotland, maybe, but, but preferably the Alps. But we've got those nice, soft, rolling green hills that seem to go on forever. So if, if that appeals, you're in the right place. So we have to ask the question of you guys that everyone has on their mind right now, knowing everything we do about Supersede, and that is, do you watch The Crown? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that is what we were all thinking. <laughs> Everybody's wondering that. Our household absolutely does. Very big fans of it. Binged the first season in um, a relatively quick succession. Same here. Ben, as a citizen, what about you? What do you think of The Crown? So so I'm, I'm useless with uh, watching whole series, but I, I can confess that due to a, a fairly addicted partner to having seen probably about three episodes out of every season. Just for okay. Okay. <laughs> osmosis and being in the same room and it has been very good for those three episodes i've been much less able to we americans are just fascinated with it i've only seen like three episodes uh, well most americans then yeah, there's Lee. so let's get to what we're really here about today and that's to talk about supersede the company that you two founded that is a digital reinsurance play and very very interesting let's start by asking one of you two take your choice Tell us what the heck is Supersede and what it is that you all do. Yeah, sure. Happy to give a, a quick flyby tour. Uh, so we're a, a reinsurance focused technology company. Uh, as you mentioned, we're, we're fully independent, just sort of uh, Jared, myself and our, our team on a, a mission uh, to, to try and make the, the reinsurance industry better for the people who work within it. I uh, we, we were both practitioners ourselves, and, and we help all of the practitioners, whether they're sedents, uh, brokers, or, or reinsurers. Uh, we, we've crystallized our solution uh, in this past year or so to focus uh, on each of those key players. So we have, for the beginning of the process, for those sedents, those, those reinsurance buyers, uh, a product called Analytics, which is all about helping them get their data into the right shape before the reinsurance purchase, which which you might think is is an easy task, but it, it takes firms months and months to get all of the the sort of pitch ready before they go to market to say, here you are, here's all our data, here's our border, our loss runs, our premiums and rate changes and triangles, etc. This is why you should reinsure us. That process is a copying and pasting and Excel and zip file nightmare. Uh, so we, we have our analytics solution to just sort that out and make it much easier for the students. Then for all those brokers out there who, who deal with 
uh, massively complicated reinsurance placements. So, so this is very close to Jared's heart as he, he was a, a reinsurance broker on some some huge Japanese deals where they had, I think, something like 50 or, or 60, uh, 60, this is uh, underwriters per risk. I uh, mean, wow. wow. you know, it's an absolute nightmare to administrate. You, you, know, you go through quotes and, and collect all those quotes and then you go through authorizations and you, you're going back and forward every time with sort of 60 different counterparties. So we built supersede placements as, as a means of managing that that really painful workflow uh, with with bits of helpful automation everywhere. So you still retain all of the the control and decision making as a broker as to who you want to trade with and how much different underwriters are going to get. But we we automate all of the the back and forth and the the tracking and, and the admin, which is, which is great. And then of course we don't forget the reinsurers themselves, without whom there would be no uh, right. reinsurance. And for the reinsurers. It's a bit closer to my experience as an underwriter where business development and, and trying to find deals is, is at the moment very reactive. You, you sort of sit and wait and hope uh, that based on your, your whining and dining and conferencing activities, which have been a lot less lately, as, right. <laughs> as we all know, um, based on that, you're hoping that, that some brokers are going to bring over or email over uh, some submissions that you might be interested in writing. So we're, we're turning that on its head. A little bit with a product called Super, the Superseed Network, where underwriters can build a, a sort of social networking or professional social networking profile uh, that shows their their risk appetites, so what lines of business and regions are they interested in, products do they write, uh, so that brokers can can actually actively go looking for for reinsurers that they want to share deals with, and and also so that the brokers can even put out a little preview of their risk. Uh, when they're going through the placement so that underwriters can can search and filter to find you know a a deal in a particular region that they might be interested in and then request access to that deal so all all these three solutions that i mentioned they they all work independently of each other so you you can as a student you can just use analytics to make your life easier Uh, if you're a broker you can use just placements to make your life easier and, and the same for the network you can you can join that and make yourself available but they also all talk to each other and all plug into each other to create a really good ecosystem effect through that as well. Let's take one step back and talk about reinsurance just for a minute, because I guarantee you there's people listening to our podcast who've heard of reinsurance, or maybe they haven't even heard of reinsurance, but they don't fully appreciate or understand what it is. And, uh, I'm probably one of those people. Uh, Lee probably is too. So explain to us, what reinsurance is and why it's so darn important. Yeah, it's an area that's often overlooked. At its most simple, it's essentially just when the insurance companies themselves buy insurance. And the reason that they're doing that is is in a lot of the same ways that that we might buy insurance. You know, instead of trying to hold enough money to rebuy your car in case you total it, you'd much rather pay a thousand or two thousand dollars as a deductible and then have the insurance kick in to support you. It's a similar mechanism at play for the insurance companies. They're looking at, you know, how do they optimize their balance sheet and their capital. And in a lot of cases, it makes sense for them to to pay a premium to secure additional protection in the event of, you know, a catastrophic loss or an unexpected accumulation of losses throughout the year. So, you know, you look at large local insurers, you have a state farm or an all state American family. A lot of these firms are going to buy some degree of reinsurance protection. So in the event of, of a, a hurricane or an earthquake, they can claim additional insurance support for their policyholders. And it's essentially the framework that keeps the insurance ecosystem sort of vibrant and allows the insurers to deliver products to their to their end users. And it's traditionally been kind of a dark world, not well known, kind of antiquated. Is my perception of that correct? Yeah, I think so. And, and then coming from, from the Lloyd's background, uh, myself, I, I can talk to the very traditional ways of doing things, which, which I think, you know, have, have a lot of value in terms of the face-to-face and, and the relationship building. And it is a smaller community as well. So I, I think the Swiss Re numbers put PNC as a market at about Two trillion dollars, and, and then of that, about eight point four percent or something is a number that sticks in my head. Um, so, like two hundred billion or so is then reinsurance of that. So, you, so you have basically 
probably an equivalent amount of people in the industry looking at reinsurance as well. So everyone who works in insurance, about one in 10 of them is working on reinsurance. So it creates a sort of quite a close knit community around the world with some some quite dedicated hubs who are used to doing things in quite a similar way. Uh, and it also means that that, that group of, of the, the one out of 10 people gets neglected quite often when it comes to innovation or new technologies, because most most tech firms and most vendors would rather serve nine out of 10 people and not one out of 10. So Jared and I and, and most of our peers in that community found ourselves quite underserved by uh, traditional vendors who are looking at the insurance space. I mean, there are some super big names in it who are super active and, and you hear of not just from writing reinsurance, but also from being involved now in different technology acceleration and, and whatnot, like Munich Re comes to mind. I have a quick side question. Why are so many located in Bermuda and the Bahamas and, and offshore? Is there a particular reason for that? So I think there's, there's been a, a few historical reasons why some of the hubs have come together. Um, London, interestingly, you know, has, has the whole history associated with doing business there. Bermuda is, is almost entirely made up of reinsurance people, it seems. When you, when you go there, you can't, can't walk down the street without bumping into, into reinsurance people. I, I think there's, there's some heavy tax incentives that, that have mm. been built around those communities to, to support that, that type of trading infrastructure. And I, I know that it's actually, I don't know if you've been out to Bermuda and if you've met uh, or, or spent any time there, but it, it's really uh, quite fascinating just how much the the state and and the the culture is 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 built to support reinsurance as an industry in in a very collaborative way. So you have the sort of the national sort of leader of the country attending reinsurance conferences and talking about how important it is that the Muda stays at the forefront of of reinsurance innovation. Which you know it's really hard to imagine. You know Biden in the US or or in our case you know uh, Boris Johnson standing up and mm-hmm. do, do, doing a talk or, or appearing at a a reinsurance conference and, and talking about how that was, you know, in their top five priorities for the year. Uh, so it's quite cemented, I think, some of these locations uh, as, as as reinsurance hubs. The other thing I would add to that, which I think is, is an interesting element, is that part of it is made possible by the fact that reinsurance licensing globally differs quite radically from insurance. Whereas in insurance, you oftentimes need local paper and state, local regulatory right. or state level reporting requirements. Reinsurance operates by design on a global basis. And so when you think about deploying essentially a capital vehicle on a global sort of um, on a global footprint, the way they sort of think about it is where are there the hubs for us to sort of anchor that capital whereby we can access risks, risks from all over the world. So the Bermudan reinsurers are writing deals from everywhere on the planet, not just a certain geography or similar. So it's not just them reinsuring risks in Bermuda. They're reinsuring um, insurers in, in Asia and in North America and across Europe. And so it's looking for ways for them to sort of anchor that, that capital position, but knowing they're going to be deploying it on a purely global basis. And capital is really their business as far as I understand it, that reinsurers provide, you know, the, the backup, the money, the insurance, if you will, uh, uh, to do that. And, and the, the amount of money is extraordinary. It's, it's, it's a stunning number. Like you, like you said, um, before, where does that money come from? Does it come from the, from the policy holders paying their premiums? I mean, there has to be some backup to all this. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting one, and I, I think the the way that we've seen the alternative capital market arise is really interesting as sort of a, a side narrative to this. So you have your your big traditional reinsurance companies, say you know the, the big four Europeans, the Munich Re, Swiss Re, Score, and, and Hanover Re, who are all very much I uh, based around a traditional I uh, sort of equity based model where effectively you're you're getting reinsured by a company and that company's balance sheet is on the line so at the end of the day you you are you're guaranteed that your reinsurer is going to pay so long as that reinsurer doesn't go out go out of business effectively and, and run out of money so they are, they're they're holding very large amounts of capital and, and assets themselves in a portfolio aiming for enough diversification obviously so they don't have to hold 
the full amount that they would need in order to pay claims. So they're, they're mixing, you know, Japanese typhoon with Californian earthquake and right. with European windstorm, etc. So that they've they've got many sources of premium that they they can use to to fill up that float that they can pay out of. But but what's been really interesting, as I was sort of hinting at there, is that over over time, and, and I, I don't want to put a number of years on it because it's been happening for a very long time, just ever more increasingly, as we have seen, it, it become easier and easier to introduce more capital markets, capital that's not attached to a an entity and, and the actual sort of running of that company anymore as, as the guarantee. So you're seeing collateralized forms of reinsurance where it's quite literally the money needed to pay your, your claim is set aside in a special purpose vehicle ready for that claim to be paid. So, you, so you're then choosing as a as a buyer of reinsurance, uh, do I want to be protected based on whether or not Munich Re continues to exist as a company or or the guarantee that this special purpose vehicle has this money in it for me anyway? Uh, we could talk for ages about that if, you, if you're interested. That there's, there's loads of pros and cons around, around the different uh, forms, but... I guess the more traditional answer is it's it's just a huge accumulation of of premiums from from many different perils around the world that has been built up into a company that you're you're counting on being around much much like we do as policyholders. I have become so interested in reinsurance over the past few years since I first went to InsureTech Connect and realized all these companies were out there. I was shielded from it. I just didn't know. So we have the four main ones that you had mentioned, are there new companies, new major companies coming in? Or is that what, what, what you're referring to as a special vehicle? Like, is it an open market where new reinsurance companies are just popping up? Yeah, it, it's it's a fascinating space at the moment. So you have the, the big four Europeans, as I mentioned, as sort of one cohort. Then you have a number of state reinsurers have typically been been the largest players. So China Re and, and Korean Re two of the big ones where historically they were sort of mandatory reinsurers. So if you were an insurance company located in Korea, you had to give at least 50% of your your reinsurance that you were buying to the state reinsurer before then shopping overseas for your reinsurance. Um, But then over the last sort of 10, 20 years or so, many of these state reinsurers have uh, changed their models so that they're now uh, able to benefit from the diversification again of you know, not being on the hook for if all of, you know, the risk happens in one country at once, but instead spreading their own portfolios around the world. So you have, you have these big state reinsurers that play as well in the game. And then like, like you were hinting at there, you have, you have some other challenger players that are growing uh, very quickly. You, you have a mixture of uh, insurance companies, like specialty insurance companies that have large reinsurance arms. So, uh, so AXA has AXA XL Re, MS Amlin has a large reinsurance arm. Um, and, and a number of others sort of sort of in that that group. But then you also have some more pure play reinsurers uh, like Renaissance Re, uh, who, depending on how you measure things, come out as, as a very high ranking in terms of size. And as, as you were getting out there as well with the sort of alternative players, some of these reinsurers now are also starting to mix the the way that they do business between trust in my balance sheet and me still being around, and trust in me as a expert pricer of reinsurance risk. Uh, so, so Renry in, in particular, and, and a number of others, I uh, will will write uh, sort of risk-free deals on behalf of third-party capital, and then they'll receive a fee income in exchange for doing that underwriting. Well, so that if you're a you know a, a capital markets investor, a big pension fund, or something. You you effectively pay Renry to try and get a return on your capital instead. So so there's there's some really novel ways emerging for how how this, this risk can be underwritten. And all Renry is doing is they're they're providing all the pipes for the money to run through or the 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 information the the analysis whatnot the expertise, exactly. but not the capital. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So let's talk more specifically about um, Supersede. And how you guys fit in this weird, crazy world that you that you work in? It's not uncommon for us to hear from people. We work on the claim side, and it's not a, from the claims professionals, particularly the senior leaders that we talk to. That that, that we'll hear something. Somebody say, "Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a reinsurance meeting. I'm traveling to London. I'm traveling to Bermuda. 
we're meeting with our reinsurers, we're replacing our reinsurance. It all sounds very um, complex and mysterious. Right. And that's the world that you guys were working in. So tell us about the process that you went through. It strikes me as antiquated in many ways. Lloyd's is a super big part of it. Tell us how you kind of came to the idea and how you brought it together. Yeah, I, th- I think um, starting quickly on sort of the antiquated nature of the industry, I think it's in a lot of ways the result of how this business has come to pass. I think when you're looking at, when you're comparing a reinsurance policy, if you will, to something like a homeowner's or a car policy, which are relatively homogenous, reinsurance is is and has always been entirely bespoke. So an insurance company can can purchase any number of products, you know, on a combined multi-product basis, like they can do property and casualty together. They can carve those things out. They can um, aggregate the policies that they want to cover in any number of ways. And the policies always get structured in a, in a huge variety of ways. There's not just a, here's the reconstruction cost and, you know, the personal property component. There's, you know, it's usually towered or tiered and there's a variety of mechanisms that you can build a program with. And as a result of this being entirely bespoke historically, it's been really hard to, to digitize in the same way you've you know, digitized or automated purchasing car insurance or purchasing homeowner's insurance, which have relatively standardized features at any given case. Um, but there's been this sort of effort for the last couple decades to make an effort to do this. When I was working at Aon to start my career, I got really involved with some early efforts that Aon was building to to help place facultative reinsurance automatically, which is is another type of reinsurance. They began to sort of put these policies together. But even at the time, I was sort of recognizing that a solution built by one big company wouldn't really service the the industry or the policyholders sufficiently because as as we sort of described a little bit, you have the case where it's not sort of a one-to-one. It's it's a tripartite relationship between the insurance company or the sedent, the broker who sort of supports them, and then the reinsurers, which is oftentimes a panel or a subscription of reinsurers on any given deal. So trying to build a solution for just one company never really fit the bill. And then it needed to be by default really dynamic in how it was structured because there's not really these sort of set of rigid rules and frameworks by which you can build an automated process. So when I was when I was at Aon, I was sort of getting exposed to the early iterations of that. And it, it always fascinated me. Um, and then I joined the broking side of the business and I got to see firsthand what it was actually like to place business. And it really made clear that the solutions that were just trying to create a couple pieces of digitization around it, um, but weren't addressing the workflow challenges of, as Ben mentioned, managing 60 or more reinsurers on any given deal, you know, tracking quotes, tracking authorizations, issuing final signings or agreements. There's, there's a huge amount of admin that goes into this process. And it was really glaring where those, those solutions had sort of were left wanting. Um, when I when I joined the consulting team and I met Ben, he'd just come over from the underwriting side and we were doing a lot of exploring around the pain points that the reinsurers were asking us about. Um, if you look at the historical model, the big four uh, Europeans, they still have offices all over the world. But you saw this emergence of reinsurers who wanted to enter the fray but they didn't want to go out and set up tens of thousands of offices in every country because they right. knew they could write that business from Bermuda. Or they knew they could write it from Zurich. But there was still this need to get in front of the clients and in front of the brokers to see the deal. So as as we began sort of tossing ideas back and forth on our evenings and on, on runs together and things, we sort of started thinking through what what would a solution look like that brought digital reinsurance, you know, out, you know, into the world. And it was a combination of sort of these component parts together. It it had to be about people because, you know, the bigger and the more complex purchases get, 
the more important the role of a trusted intermediary plays. Brokers control just a little bit more than 75% of global reinsurance. Sure. And, and that's not a technology issue. That's because the clients just so deeply value the role the broker plays. Um, and then you had this need to, to help those brokers find the right underwriters, but also let those underwriters who didn't have offices in every country more easily find brokers and risk. And it began this emergence of um, the earliest version of the company, which was, which was called Riskbook at the time. And then through that discovery, we began to sort of lean into the data piece, which is now our analytics proposition. But it was us sort of thinking through what are the pain points that the people in the industry are actually telling us they feel? And what were the pain points that we felt whilst we did the work? Um, and then from there, beginning to sort of unpack the component parts and, and put together what we thought was was a solution that, that fit the bill. At its core, who is your main customer? Is it the reinsurance? Is it the underwriters? Is it the broker? Is, is it everybody? And it's this whole place that everyone can go and meet and find? I think we're, we're helping everyone to help everyone, ideally. So <laughs> I love that. It's, it's a tough one, right? So, so we, we did a lot of work initially at the reinsurer end. But it's really hard to, to change things when you're right at the end of the process. So if you're the reinsurer, you're, you're the one receiving the deals. So when I, when I was an underwriter, we would, we would get an email from the broker. I, and inside the email, there'd be some attachments, but then there'd also be some, some login details buried inside one of the attachments that would take you to a separate file sharing site that would take you to be able to download for three hours some modeling files um, and then when you decided you wanted to authorize or, or quote, it'd be a mixture of logging into someone's authorizations portal uh, or alternatively sending another email back and getting to CC people. And it, it was all very messy in terms of what you got and how you interacted with the broker. But then when you opened up these attachments as well, uh, there, there'd typically be a lot of challenges with the data or, or limitations around how that data was coming through that the broker's couldn't do anything about because actually those problems in turn were coming from the, the seed and from the buyer uh, at the other end. So you'd have an insurance company uh, who also needs help to be able to help the broker to give better data to the reinsurers. Um, so, so I think our, our sort of funnel uh, serves all of the customers, as we said, the, the seed and the broker and the reinsurer. But what we're trying to make sure we do is that is that make any benefit that we help the, the sequence with carry through to the brokers and the reinsurers. So those analytics packs uh, where we're enabling uh, with our analytics solutions, the, the buyers, the, so the seeded teams to build a digital submission pack instead of what traditionally is just a sort of big dump of spreadsheets into a zip file, making a digital validated clean submission pack instead. We make sure then that that can be passed on to the broker through the placement platform so that the, the broker then using the placement platform can add that extra layer of deal data. So the, the complex structures that Jared mentioned, instead of that structure being a, a drawing on the back of a, a handkerchief or, or something, it seems to be always sort of sketched out and, and loosely described, you can actually design that deal in the placements platform. And then together, that deal structure, plus all that clean data that the student's been working on, gets passed to the reinsurer um, who then has the tools they need to price a deal and to review a deal much more quickly. And by the way, because they've got the network, they're finding deals that are much more relevant to them much more quickly as well. Uh, so, so it all sort of snowballs through uh, to make yeah. a better reinsurance experience for everyone. So I understand. So we have three worlds within this platform. We have our network where everybody can get to know each other. You move straight into the the, the placements application where everyone can... Uh, start making deals and make those happen. And then we have the analytics where we can take it and say, here's, here's what's happening. Once those things, you know, all, all get done. It, is that right? Yeah. So, so effectively we, we enhance that whole deal making process. So instead of it being, I, I think, I think you could almost look at it as, as taking everything that's currently offline. So all the things that are done initially. So, so the network piece is currently, you know, somebody's physical Rolodex and who they happen yeah. to have met in person at a conference, we take that piece and we put it online. And then the placements piece as well, that, that's currently, you know, loads of emails with offline spreadsheet attachments and, and all sorts of stuff there. We take that and put it all online in a secure 
placement platform. And then for the analytics piece, again, it's, it's spreadsheet analysis that's done in silos, managed offline, and, and loads of emails back and forth in, in the seed and zone sort of internal organization. Uh, and we take all that and we make digital submission packs instead that can be shared online. So we, we really bring all of that sort of stuff that was offline online so it can just be shared so much more easily. And it makes everybody's job That's much fantastic. better. fantastic. So you took it out of email. I would think that there's so many people in the reinsurance world who would be saying, essentially, oh, thank God you guys are here. <laughs> I would we, imagine. We, we needed you so desperately. Is that what you're finding? We're finding the feedback to be incredibly positive. Yes. Um, it's We're really fortunate. We spent a lot of time talking to users and networking around the industry to ex- sort of expand upon our previous experiences and things. But, you know, the more we present it to, to people, the more there's this excitement around Oh, this is this is what we've been waiting for. This is the way this should all connect, and the way the parties are brought together. Um, we we make the placement platform piece and the network piece entirely free, and again, it's to make it where it's super easy for anyone right. to get involved. For you know, if you're a, a really small broking firm or a, a new a new reinsurer that's just being set up in Bermuda, you instantly have access to what is becoming the sort of worldwide tool to connect the reinsurance industry. So that connectivity piece was just always super, super important to us. And we didn't want to have it where this innovation that everyone is is almost clamoring for is sort of left to only the biggest firms who can afford these massive subscription fees and licenses and, and, and things. So We've done that intentionally. We we do charge for the people to use the analytics piece because it's an additional tool that they can have. But when you think about how we connect this industry, um, the feedback that we've been getting is amazing. And you know, when we remove the barriers to entry around that, the, right. the engagement has been fantastic because it it's helping to facilitate and streamline all three all three parties around data flow and deal flow and everything else. So it's it's been it's been a really positive reception. Are you finding that people are utilizing the free areas of the social media type part, the the networking part, but not utilizing the pay portions of the website? How are you dealing with that? There's an ease of, of initial engagement at the different stages that helps the acceleration of those two. The network piece is by far the most used component just because it's it's essentially designed to to reflect sort of like a very built for purpose LinkedIn or something where you go there, you say what you're interested in looking at. Those parties can find each other. We've added new tools for brokers and and underwriters to manage their their contact lists. So as a broker, there's all these different reinsurers, but they all have slightly different appetites. So they want to write slightly Mm -hmm. different lines of business or they Mm -hmm. have different geographies. Um, But I might represent clients across a variety of those. So Mm -hmm. what this new tool is allowing me to do is not only engage with a much wider audience, but also begin to track and follow those individuals based on my own categories. So I have a list of, of underwriters who I know really like uh, Japanese earthquake business. So I have them on one list. And I have another group of underwriters who I know are really, really big in you know U.S. hurricane business. So I maybe track a list of those. There might be people who are on both, um, but for a lot of indi- companies, they're different people. And it might be, it might be as well, different individuals within those firms. So Munich Re is, is sort of the, the most well-known example. They certainly write all of those types of business, but the individual underwriter who's in charge of those or writing that business will probably differ. So we've built this, this tooling around helping you not only track just what companies you want to write, but which specific individuals at those firms should you be engaging with and, and working with? I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, you're like your social media type thing for the reinsurance industry on this part of your ecosystem that you've developed. There's all kinds of different ways that you could monetize that in the future, much like social media has specialized advertising or reaching out to certain people that need certain things, depending on their profiles. Is that on your roadmap? Yeah. When, when we think about the broader ecosystem, there's a lot of things that open up there. I think that's a, a really exciting potential one. Um, to, to finish off the, the other question, I didn't mean to 
Um, oh, sorry. Short, sorry I, no, I didn't want to shortchange you on the answer there. Because that's so easy to engage, we have a, a, a quite a lot of engagement with that. Um, the next level is more, you have to have a bit more company engagement to do placement. Again, anyone, it doesn't cost, but there's a bit of, let's make sure the company is ready to engage and do that. And then the third is on the analytics piece, we see a very high correlation between brokers who want to start doing the placements and depending on the type of business that they write, if they write a lot of treaty business, the the appeal and the interest in also licensing um, the analytics solution is is quite is quite significant. So you're not seeing a huge drop off between those two things, um, especially for the slightly larger firms. Um, but you're right. So when we think about how this ecosystem evolves, and we very much think about it as as this ecosystem that's emerging, um, there's a lot of really exciting things we can begin to do. Uh, you know, and if you think about the networks and the appetites is, you know, promoting different things and making sure that, you know, someone is seeing a thing that you want to mention or articulate or helping, you know, prioritize risks to an underwriter that they, that they might be interested in. So kind of like that Amazon, you know, people who bought this also buy that analogy. So these, these types of things, but there's a whole suite of of services and there's there's this analog ecosystem that already exists. Um, we use a the Zillow or Zoopla model quite a lot, and I think there's a lot of similarities there. Where you have you know calculators and you have you know um, right dual mapping zones, and there's all these sort of things that historically have existed in an analog world, but in these ecosystems, you're sort of seeing it converge where it's really easy for you to, you know, move out of Waco into Boston, but have a good sense of like, where should I go in Boston? What are the good school zones? What is that? Where, you know, uh-huh. and, and narrow down your house search and find the right, you know, mortgage provider and all these kind of things. They've made it really easy for you to go to one place and sort of support you on that journey. And we see ourselves playing a similar role for reinsurance. That's a great analogy. I can see that exactly. When you're facing a task that's so complex and monumental, it's it's nice to have a way to sort down to, you know, the key aspects of it, right? And and in that example, you know, we're we're not taking away the real estate agent. You're you don't want to go on to Craigslist and buy the cheapest house that's on the on the site. You, you want to find make sure it's the right one for you and your family. You still want to have the the agent sort of confirm that what you're seeing and is is what you're getting and give you that additional sense of comfort that this is the area or this is, you know, the, the inspections have gone well and, and give you that sense of comfort. So it's it's not about removing any one party, but it's just about really streamlining the way that those parties connect. And and then you look at the additional players, someone who's doing repairs or moving facilities and moving vehicles and, and companies. Again, it's just helping you find the party who can help you do an additional adjacent task and vet them and make that really easy. So we see this whole ecosystem beginning to emerge right. out, of, out of what we're doing. In the time we have left, I, w- I want to touch on just a couple other things real quickly. You guys have been involved, I think, in a f- couple different accelerators, if I'm not mistaken. And, and most recently, I didn't even know that Lloyd's Lloyd's has an accelerator. Is that correct? And you guys were t- recently chosen to be part of it? Yeah, that's right. So, so super excited to be a, a part of the Lloyd's, the Lloyd's Lab, as it is known, um, which, which again, it is a very competitive sort of accelerator. I think we were very lucky to be, like you make your own luck, but we we're very, very lucky to be chosen as, as one of 11 startups, I think, that are going through out of, I think, nearly 200 applications. So, wow. Um, pleased to be in the zone now and working really closely with a number of Lloyd syndicates. The, the way they the way they structure it is they assign you mentors or, or rather mentors assign themselves. So mentors have kind of volunteer themselves to become your attache and guide you through the Lloyd's ecosystem. So we, we're having really incredible progress much more quickly than we'd, we'd get outside of an, an accelerator or, or a normal environment traditionally. So you have this brief window of magic where for 10 weeks the Lloyd's community is is open to the idea of exploring innovation on a whole new level and they're there up for trying new things and opening their ears where you know normally they've got to focus on business as usual and keeping things running and and we're, we're the lucky few at the moment who get to go through that process with them so speaking to many syndicates uh, 
every week at the moment and helping them see how they can adopt Superseed. I'm wondering how big of a party you guys had when you received notification that you were in the cohort. It's a good question, Ed, and it's a funny one. So we, we, we've struggled with, um, with parties recently. With a, so our, our whole team is remote, which, which is great in, in many ways. I think we all love being remote, and we, we started the company as a fully remote company. Our, our co-founder uh, on the technical side, so there's, there's a third co-founder, Jason, who's our, our CTA, uh, looks after all the technology, um, is a, a very much a tech nomad who, who travels the world with his laptop coding away and, and he's, he's, he's introduced us all to this amazing uh, remote life but we haven't quite worked out how to do parties well we're getting good at off-sites virtual off-sites we're, we're getting quite good at now but uh, yeah parties are hard so so we're ho- hoping that when when the world reopens up we'll, we'll do a big event uh, celebrate all these different things uh, the, the Lloyd Slab and, and others I mean that's a that needs to be a big old party because that's a big deal hey I do have one question I would be sad if I didn't ask, how does a concert pianist from University of Oxford wind up in the world of insurance, Ben? How is that? Did one day you you wake up and decide, I like the uh, piano, but insurance, that's that's my passion. That's a great question. So somebody's been checking out my my online profile, clearly. No, um, <laughs> it's, 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 a very, it's a very good question. I think for me, I, I was at university and... I lived in a house of very interesting international people whilst I was studying who were all working out what they wanted to do in the wider world. And, and I felt like I'd, I'd sort of already met everybody in the contemporary classical music composition and performance sphere. Because uh, in, in that sort of musical space now, they've decided that there's sort of, you know, you've got all the old composers who've, who've mostly died now. And it's a weird frozen moment in time where we try and work out what happens next in a very small room for who knows how long. And I wanted to go and see more of the world, basically, and go and meet new people, go and go on these journeys into other spaces that I hadn't been into. Uh, and I always had the piano up, up my sleeve as, a, as an additional uh, party trick. I, I did once... Yeah, uh, you fall back play, on it. Yeah, I, I, did, I did once play piano at an yeah. uh, underwriter's Christmas party, which was very entertaining. As a <laughs> but, but yeah, and it, it ended up exploring a new industry and, and haven't looked back, to be honest. I think it's... Yeah, it's, it's a brilliant space and, and I've, I've loved the opportunity for continuing creativity and I guess public speaking and, and presenting has, has become my equivalent of performing I, nowadays. I love it. Well, one of the things that we found in the insure tech world is that like when Lee and I became involved in insurance, which was a long time ago, it was kind of the accidental place where you might end up to have a good career in something that mattered. But now in the insure tech world, it's far more deliberate. And uh, though there are some happy accidents that happen, it's really the marriage of two unique different worlds. It's, it's cool that um, all you guys have ended up there. Now you, you Jared, on the other hand, you're, you're really an insurance guy. Yeah. I've, I've been an insurance guy since I, since I left school, I started my career really early on in sort of the, the property casualty personal line space. I did that for a couple of years before and I wanted a bit of a change um, and then kind of by happen chance landed and fell into, into reinsurance. But yeah, like Ben found it immediately fascinating and yeah, sort of never looked back. I think I'd always had a, a passion and an interest in how technology impacted industries. And, and I was always looking at, you know, in, in this is, you know, early 2000s, still looking at, you know, what could the personal line space look like with, with innovation? And, you know, I'm super excited to have watched the rise of the Metro Miles and Lemonades and, and Sean and the Kin team, what they're doing. And then when I came into reinsurance, it was a similar thing. There was this, they're on the cusp of, of, of an innovation wave. And I was early enough to watch a lot of that whilst I still learned. And then when, you know, when it was time for me and Ben to take the leap, I felt we'd had sufficient time to develop theories and why we thought something worked and, and have seen historical efforts and, and everything else. So it's, it's a fabulous time to be in the space. And I think there's a, a lot of emerging innovation. When you look at the personal line space, to your point, they, there's very much this, this thing where um, outsiders are coming in saying, well, when I was buying insurance, where I was going through this, these are all the things I didn't like. And I want to, you know, 
help make an impact here. And, and you right. see a lot of that kind of on the distribution side. But when you get into other parts of the industry, I think probably claims might be one of these. You're actually seeing a lot of really exciting innovation from people who've kind of cut their teeth in the space and they've gotten to see, you know, the inner workings of these organizations now stepping out and saying, I've seen what it looks like and I see why it's really hard to do this well. But, but I have this, um, this entrepreneurial drive and I want to make it, I make, make an impact here. And then sort of stepping away from that corporate, that very secure and normal corporate life into the far less secure and, and more chaotic startup world, but with really exciting ideas and, so, and some real alignment of how they can execute on them. Well, and that's really what you guys have done. I mean, you, you guys came out of the reinsurance world. You're marrying a whole technology side to this. I think that what you guys are doing, I think your value proposition is extraordinary. And obviously Lloyd's agrees. So it's good to know that I'm as smart as Lloyd's. Yeah, um, <laughs> isn't that good to know? Yeah. We, d- we weren't sure before. Sure. Now we are. Yeah. Uh, well, one last question before we go. Supersede. We all know what that means, but where, wh- why supersede? Where did that name come from? So it took a lot of time to, to get exactly the right, the right name for us, but we, we wanted something that was, I, I guess, encapsulating not just what we, you know, what we set out to do, but, but also really did what it said on the tin uh, in a way that people from the reinsurance world would understand. Uh, so, so supersede, obviously, meaning, you know, we're going to go beyond what was there before, which is what we've talked about today in, in this session, but, but also to seed, C-E-D-E is, is the verb that we, we use probably only in reinsurance to mean to, to give away risk and, and to, to buy reinsurance. So we're, we're super seeding. Uh, in this case, so so helping to to take that experience of seeding and make it super. So quite literally, what it what it says on the tin, uh, making reinsurance super. Right. I'm looking at a definition that says the older models have now been superseded. Um, and I, like I think that. that I think that that's what you guys are after. And it's really exciting for us, for Lee and I, when we're on with companies that are part of a real change. Yeah. In a large way. And that's what you guys are. And everybody who we have on is terrific and interesting. Everybody. But some can really shake things up. And, th- and that's how we feel about you guys. So we're, we're thrilled uh, to have you with us and thrilled that Eleni introduced us. And we, we hope to talk to you guys again, maybe sometime after your time at Lloyd's and listening back on that. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if there's a chance for us to do travel and we, we spend some time in the U.S., we'd love to, to do one of these in person if, if possible. Always, always a pleasure. Well, thank you all so much. It was, Thanks, it was just guys. absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Really enjoyed yeah, thank it. Thank you. you. It's great when we get to talk about things <laughs> that we don't know a lot about. Absolutely. Today was a good example of that. Yeah. Fortunately, we got to talk to people who know a lot about reinsurance. Unlike a, you and me. A lot. And we've said this a lot, but we talked to some very highly educated people today who know what they're talking about. They've been in this space for a while. It's not just a, hey, let's come up with some idea and then do it. I mean, they saw this as a problem. Yes. And then they developed a solution. And it right. seems like not only do we agree that it's an amazing solution, but there right. are other companies out there who also say, hey, you're onto something. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. They saw a problem. Right. And a solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. The solution, I'm not saying the technology isn't very complex. I'm sure it is. But it's really pretty simple. Let's bring all the different parts of this ecosystem together on one platform. Well, yeah, and that's what they were trying to say is these aren't normal deals. These aren't like saying, hey, I've got... I need this. Can you be my reinsurance company? And they say, sure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's reinsurance will say, hey, I'll I'll take just a small little fraction of it. Uh, You'll have to go somewhere else for the rest of it. Maybe maybe you have a lot of different companies that have to come through and and bid. I mean, they're very complicated. So I could only imagine these emails and login systems and attachments, how complicated it gets. It's got to save hours and hours in in a time management study, right? You would have to be able to save Millions of dollars just in millions people's of times. Dollars. Yeah. Millions of dollars. Well, just think how intimidating it is just to find reinsurance. I mean, the, the, that, that's just starting there. And, yeah. uh, 
and then all the way cascading down all the way to actually acquiring it. You can see why brokers are so critical. Absolutely. I thought it was a great podcast. I was very excited that this one came up. Great podcast. Great idea. We thank Eleni for making the introduction, which is, you know, what happens when you've done a bunch of podcasts like we have. You have your own little network and ecosystem. And so we thank her and wish her all the best at Superseed. And we thank Ben and Jared for being with us. I had a thought when we started, and that is Ben and Jared. Sounds like an ice cream company, doesn't it? Well, whenever I was searching <laughs> for a uh, Ben on piano, I kept talking about Ben and Jerry's on uh, piano. So, yeah. Well, we thank Ben and Jared for a delicious podcast. It was very sweet. And <laughs> nice. we thank you guys for putting up with us once again. Yes. At least we hope we're informative. And that's the price you pay for listening to our podcast is having to listen to us. Mm -hmm. We thank you for being here. And look forward to seeing you next time on FNO InsureTech. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>